Welcome to the Author Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. I'm Kai from Tinker's Venture. And this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. Uh, as usual tonight, we're we're doing it over the Zoom. We're we're not our normal time zones: East Coast, Midwest, West Coast. You guys both are on the East Coast. I'm in the Midwest. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully it rains at some point tonight because it's been dry here forever and i'm really sick of it so uh we're gonna go a little all over the place tonight we are gonna stay a little toyota centric which i'm probably more content with because we've talked about a lot of other weird vehicles lately and i don't want to do it anymore yeah also given that you know we're in like what 160 ish episodes in more than that uh, but yeah more than that well yeah we're we're we've established ourselves as a fairly toyota centric podcast so <laughs> we've talked about enough forerunners and land cruisers over this time but we've owned probably closing on 10 between the two of us so yeah well like yeah seven... i'm pretty good at centric yes, yes you are you absolutely are and we're we are going to get there and i, I think we're at like 165 165 well we probably yep. talked about toyota four before and 160 of them so um <laughs> so you, you and i don't really have any updates tonight the the biggest thing yeah. is that something leaked out and i know like when the show airs we're going to be behind like it'll actually mm-hmm. have debuted but like we want to talk about it so we're going to talk yeah. about it <laughs> yeah so so the way we're going to cover this is kind of uh speculative but everybody knows that the fourth gen toyota tacoma is on its way um the very interesting thing is that the ford ranger will debut you know four days nine days or whatever before um but yeah fourth gen tacoma big deal big deal we know that there's a trail hunter we know that there's going to be a hybrid option and toyota has confirmed that there will be a manual transmission um the combination of all of those aforementioned you know excitable things is to be determined but uh where the third gen Tacoma didn't go in terms of innovation and pushing the limit, it seems that they actually are trying this with the fourth gen Tacoma, which having spent time in the third gen Tundra is a little scary. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little worrying. But yeah, Chris pulled up the picture here. And this is apparently a photo, an actual photo that somebody was able to pull from the Toyota website by (laughs) what, what was the methodology? They like, it's literally, it's the the lamest thing ever. Yeah. They changed the year and pulled it up and this image came up because all, so for those of you who aren't in web development, like you load an image and it has its own web address so that the website can pull it and put it on the webpage and they just guess the URL of where the image would be uploaded thinking oh i bet toyota's like planning ahead and this mm-hmm. is a image that was supposedly a part of that search obviously we cannot confirm that uh our friends at the audiotopia entitled it correctly like is this the 2024 tacoma like we don't know like <laughs> but there's a lot going on visually <laughs> from everything we know and everything we can guess this is accurate uh take the current the third gen give it the or, you know the third gen tundra's headlights and you know design it's, features and then like cut the bumper the way that the zr2 did for its first gen and you know that's that's it it's well and remember there was that like um uh, electric concept when they were like oh all the everything's going electric or whatever like mm-hmm. now you can really start to see if you compare that electric concept to what yeah you're right. The speculation is now on this new image, like you can really start to see the lines coming through. Obviously, this one doesn't have the hood scoop because it's mm-hmm. supposed to be the electric version. So mm-hmm. there's no need to ram air into some kind of hood scoop there. But the right. bulges on the hood still line up from the new one. A lot of the body panels down the side still match. The Definitely the headlights are the same. And then obviously yeah. our fog lights and then potential so skin the light. same. It's the same lighting treatment as the Tundra. Yeah, but it still also kind of looks like somebody just typed a really descriptive thing into like Dolly (laughs) and and hope for the best. And and this one is still that like representation image. So yeah, yeah. So Kai, you have any uh, any speculative thoughts? 
So so that that image that leaked today, that almost looked a little wider than that electric truck. So um, it'll be really cool if they do something like the ZR2 that has actual wider control arms, wider tracks, so have more travel. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have very high hope that this Gen Tacoma will have a front locker um, because the, the Land Cruiser 300 going from the 200, 200 has no locker, the 300 front and rear. Yep. Uh, and both Tundra and Sequoia now get the rear locker now from mm -hmm. going no locker. So it just makes sense for the Tacoma to get a front. Yeah. So locked. Well, so the 200 and the concurrent GX and whatnot, they have the center diff lock, which is, it means right. basically nothing. It's front rear 50 50. Um, yeah. But in, if you could count, the number of vehicles that have a front diff lock today, it's, I mean, there's nothing in Toyota. There's the ZR2, the new Z, it's got a front diff lock, and then uh, the Wrangler and the Bronco. Gladiator and the Bronco. Yep. And yeah. uh, do we count the new in Ineos, Ineos, Granadier, whatever, however the. Yeah, we can. Count you know, that. So we, can, we can we count that yeah so and then the g wagon and the g wagon you're right yep the triple lock yep um but it, it's yeah it's pretty in terms of off-roading i mean you know the way you look at things and you have the engineering background so you can call me out if i'm wrong here but the best way to approach traction in sequence is assuming you're starting with a four wheel drive base is adding an LSD in the back or like an automatic locker, then adding a rear locker, then adding, you know, a front LSD and then adding a front locker combined with the rear locker. Um, and Toyota has yet to go there. Mm -hmm. There were periods of time, um, what was it? First gen Tacoma had a rear locker, and third gen Forerunner had a rear locker that was available with the four wheel drive system. But we, I don't think the Tacoma has seen the second gen didn't have that, and the third gen had a TRD Pro had a rear. No, so I think I think the second the second gen and the third gen Tacoma both had rear locker as option for their off road. Uh, some type of off-road uh, package. Um, you, you don't have to go to the TRD Pro. Uh, and the, the rear locker on the the current, on, on, on all the current mid-sized Toyota, they, they all have the rear locker that mm. been for a while. I have the first gen Tacoma that has the rear locker that has the TRD off-road package. And, and going way back to the 80 series, uh, and some early years, uh, 100 series Land Cruiser, they have front and rear. Mm, the triple lock. Correct. Chris knows quite well. <laughs> I was I was open front and back on my 80 series. Yeah. Well, and my 100 series as well. <laughs> but that's because that's because it's an LX though. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think that that that's a big step, and especially. Just the recent years, from the starting from the ZR2 and a Bronco, uh, the number of vehicles with front locker increases. Uh, mm -hmm. Not the Land Cruiser 300. So I think it's definitely the the, the 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 trend. I mean, in terms of actual physical hardware that can improve your off-road capability, that isn't something like you know like flares or wheels or tires it's the for the manufacturers it's the most important thing for them to include that is you know a rear locker um but you know it's a it's a tough position for toyota you know with the with the the fourth gen tacoma coming um because the only mid-sized competitor with a front locker right now is zero two 
Um, but that's not sexy. Like that doesn't sell trucks, you mm-hmm. know? So it, it's, it's, it's going to come in my opinion, it's going to come a lot down to the way it looks, the way they can position it the same way that they've done with the current TRD pro. Cause it doesn't, it's 55 grand. It doesn't have anything that a zero T doesn't have, mm-hmm. you know, other than the helpful aspect of it lasting more than, you know, 84,000 well, like, miles. <laughs> when, when I was talking to a buddy after I got the LX and I was like, listen, this is what it has already. It's got oversized wheels or uh, it's got norm 16 inch wheels on it, oversized tires. It's got a two inch lift kit under it already. What, what, like I, for lack of a better word, I don't want an Instagram truck. I don't want something that's got all this stuff slapped on the outside of it. Like the next thing I'd probably add to it, obviously some skids and sliders. Mm-hmm. And I think the farthest I'll go would be adding a rear locker. Like that's yeah. the only other thing I want to do to it. And then just go wheel the crap out of it. <laughs> Cause there's enough, there's enough science behind lockers now. Like I'm not, I'm not jeopardizing all of my other reliability by sticking Mm -hmm. with my older Toyota Lexus um, just to go play with a locker. Yeah. Like I'll have a lot of fun with that and no one will know. (laughs) It's a sleeper. Exactly. It's the, it's Ah. the off-road version of a sleeper is you add lockers and don't tell anybody. Like (laughs) The thing about adding lockers or locker singular is that uh, physics hasn't changed. Yep. You know, trails have changed. There are certainly trails, and I think we can all attest to this, that we've been down a trail at a certain point, and then a few years later, gone down the same trail, and because of uh, environmental factors like erosion and rain and runoff that have carved out things that weren't there before, um, and, and because, you know, people are running big, tires that they didn't necessarily have to run before um and you know inconsequentially carved out obstacles um trails have changed and that has changed the demand for traction that we didn't necessarily have you know like in the 90s you could run a trail with a yj with open 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 and on 32s and be fine in the same drill today because of how carved out has gotten you you'd probably need like a jl on 35s you know i i want to challenge that in the yj still let's put me in the seat i can do that i'm a momentum off-roader i can handle that (laughs) yeah momentum off-road doesn't factor in mechanical sympathy right exactly i have no mechanical sympathy but i'll get there yeah (laughs) <laughs> that's different from being able to drive home though you know so yeah. dude we're leaving this thing on the trail it's a yj <laughs> i would happily walk out so i do a yj every single day um i'm sorry anyways <laughs> any uh any other fourth gen taco thoughts chris kai literally nothing um oh there, there's one interesting uh thing It'll be it'll be it'll be interesting when 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 this episode launch and we all already know what's going on is right. when when they teased the that front suspension on the TRD Pro they yep. had a teaser mm-hmm. uh, with the shock and the, it's basically brand new control arms and all that but there's no front sway bar so I am I'm very really? curious either they just don't have a front sway bar on that trim. With with that maybe that shock that the Fox shocks has some some uh, valving like a low speed compression mm-hmm. valving to to make it handle like without a sway bar or um, the sway bar is mounted to the back like the Bronco which is great so that it's or it, it, even better if Toyota make a sway bar disconnect that would be awesome uh, right. I, I don't think they will go there. But if it's mounted to the yeah, back, sure. right, and connected to the lower control arm instead of to the spindle like today, it'll be much easier to disconnect the sway bar. Mm-hmm. Uh, like today's, um, the, the Prado platform and the third gen Tacoma, the, the 
the front sway bar is connected to the spindle. So if you disconnect it, it will start poking your CV boots and all that. Um, so the best thing today is the sliding link, which doesn't give you the full 100% travel. Um, and it's kind of not reliable with the sliding link. Um, so that's why the, I had a video on sway bar and a lot of people ask, why don't you just disconnect it? Because mm -hmm. there's no good way on the Toyota platform to disconnect it. The, so the, so the awesome. best way is to, to just remove it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so kind of for, for context, you're talking to a guy who's definitely run a forerunner without him in Ross. Uh, uh, once upon a time I had a fourth gen for uh, fourth gen. Yeah. Yes. Fourth gen forerunner that was completely sway bar less. Nice. <laughs> it was, it was, yeah, my, my FJ doesn't have a front sway bar either. Uh, so that uh, this is this had not, neither front nor rear. And, the other thing in the images that we have seen are rear disc brakes. We have not seen those oh, in a while. Oh, 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 oh my <laughs> god, it's 2001. Yay. So the when did Jag race cars first introduce those? The 1950s? Yeah, the 50s. <laughs> <laughs> I Good mean, the thing, the thing is, the, the the braking system for them is like, they've employed the absolute, like, perpetuality of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it it's, it's 2023. Yep. <laughs> you know, but, but to Kai's point, the same thing, like, for Toyota to compete, is this the point at which, I mean, Jeep has, you know, the electronically disconnectable sway bars, which everybody knows are the gold standard for being able to maximize flex on the trail, um, whether the reliability is there or isn't. <laughs> uh, That's the first thing for usually. Yeah, from my understanding, the the Rubicon, you know, push button disconnect sway bars are are good until they get dirty enough and you know moisture ridden enough to the point that pushing the button doesn't actually make the disconnect happen. Um, and meanwhile, you could take like a, a fucking Milwaukee M12 with a a ratchet on it and pop it off and eight seconds um but yeah no like is where is toyota's competitive advantage when it when this is the realm in which they're competing especially with like with trail hunter you know they're they're throwing these huge names out there and mm. and and meanwhile it's like yeah i would love to see manual transmission we know there's gonna be a hybrid how does all of this overlap in that Venn diagram? You know, it's yeah. well. We, we will have some. we will have found out by the time this airs. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I think Toyota's uh, biggest advantage is still its name, it's just its reputation on reliability and the fan base. Um, I because I I'm I'm really set on buying a fourth gen when it's come out. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope it, it, it's it's a because I I remember when the third gen first launched in 2016 or 2015, it was not a great launch. It was a lot of issue, especially on the transmission. Yeah, the uh, auto is to this day. Oh, yeah, so bad. And it was altitude. <laughs> yeah, so I, I hope hope this fourth gen. Yes, usually I will tend to wait for a model year or two to buy a new vehicle, but I really want one because my my first gen is 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 really beat up. <laughs> and, you still uh, have it? I still have it. It has it has two hundred seventy thousand miles. Dang. Oh my god! <laughs> it's not much issue. It's just a uh, lot of lights on the dash because it's abused, and I I, I don't I just don't have time to take care of it. Uh, but the engines were strong. The, the check engine lights were the EVAP system. Um, oh boy! Yeah. And um, and uh, airbag doesn't work. Airbag airbag light. Um, ABS doesn't work. The module is bad. They no longer make it. So I didn't fix it. So 
a lot, lot of lights on the dash, but it's okay. Yeah. It's pretty strong. It's a first-gen Tacoma. You could sell it for more than you paid for, yeah. <laughs> regardless of condition. <laughs> mm-hmm. you yeah, you got, you got the Toyota replaced new frame, so rust-free in the Northeast. Yes. Um, rust-free in the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah, man, you're one of the few people <laughs> that we've had on the show that are like from my you know corridor of the world it seems <laughs> like everybody is you know southwest west coast or colorado yeah. has no uh, concept of rust yeah <laughs> seriously but no we're, concept we're... Of rust or a totally different frame of mind when it comes to mud and rock crawling mm-hmm. because it is just different here and people don't understand how, fact... how it's different yeah <laughs> So we have a saying in the Midwest, just don't buy anything from Chicago. Like, just stay away (laughs) from that upper Midwest. Like, and to be honest, I wouldn't buy anything out of the Northeast either. (laughs) No, it's the glory of Texas is nearby. Yeah. Yep. Just don't. The most don't buy anything from state is Florida for anybody listening. Just never, ever, ever buy anything. And it's not, everyone thinks like, oh, you know, like, it's not, they don't use salt down there no no, it's in the air it's, guys it's, it's in the air it's also and then the, florida man uh, uh, title watching go for things that they can t- tend to do uh yeah you know flood damage it's the best cars. state to register a car in yeah yeah <laughs> flood flood damage cars are as far as florida is concerned not flood damaged so no mm-hmm. they're just florida cars it's like I, I heard a recent story about a, a family who's suing a neighborhood for one of their relatives passing because the neighborhood made the uh, the company that owns the neighborhood made the neighborhood too alligator friendly. Like that's oh. the entire state. Chris, this is the second episode in a row in which you're talking about alligators. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I hate them. Um, speaking okay. of predators. I'm going to transition into the Ford Ranger Raptor. Yeah, let's talk about this quickly. Hmm. Ooh, that's a picture I haven't seen before. Yeah, so Ford, and this will be our you know discussion about this will be after the uh, the show has come out, but um, or after the release has happened rather. But yep, uh, Ford leapfrogged Toyota and said, "Yes, we're going to release the Ranger, the new Ranger." Um, which is good because the current Ranger that's on sale is uh, basically a modified, slightly modified version of the global Ranger that's been on sale since 2010. Right. So it's the second oldest vehicle on sale, second to the fifth gen Forerunner. But that's uh, not surprising. um, No, new Ranger. um, I mean, it's promising, and the Raptor looks like a mini. F-150 Raptor. So what else is there to say, you know? No, I love it. The only thing I had, I we're not sure. So the new Ranger 2.3 gas engine, so 300 to 310, which is like, that's equivalent to what Colorado and uh, Canyon are running. Yep. Uh, Ranger Raptor is probably getting the same V6 as what Brock, Bronco Raptor is. So that's the three liter uh, twin turbo V6. You know. Twin turbo or single turbo? Now I can't remember. Uh, I'm skeptical either way. Uh, the two three is an evolution of what the Focus RS engine was, and they've established a hierarchy at Ford where, you know, it's like it's two three two seven three five, and I think they're gonna, you know, it's it's cannibalism. Like, at what point does the lower model? overstep the um you know the boundaries of what it, uh, they call it like uh Cayman complex that's yeah. what they call it so the two three is single turbo the three oh is twin turbo and the three five is twin turbo and i think the yeah ranger raptor i don't think it's there's no way it's getting a three five I think the two seven is a stretch. Isn't the two seven the engine in the Bronco that has all the issues? 
can neither confirm nor deny. I feel I feel like that's what I like when we heard about it issues with Bronco engines. I'm pretty sure it was the two seven that was having the issues. Um, Most of the Bronco issues I know about are in terms of um, the uh, what's the nice way to say this? The ability to keep. Um, I'm I'm really trying to tiptoe around this. Uh, the ability to keep both front tires pointing the same direction and not <laughs> tie rod ends tie rod ends is what i'm oh, hearing yeah. you talk about tie rod ends mm-hmm. that's what connects uh, tires to things that steer I, and turn and i didn't want the words to come out of my mouth but yeah it that's... didn't it came out of my mouth and i didn't say it in reference to anything else i was just saying guessing tie rod ends it's parts yep. parts on a truck mm-hmm. that's that is uh as far as a vehicle that is supposed to be off-roadable goes um that is a fucking problem <laughs> so Real fast, before I went out to Moab with the Sequoia, you told me to disconnect my sway bars. I told you and to disconnect the front sway bar, and I told you to buy extra end links. I did take extra end links, but I did not disconnect my sway bar. So um, let's talk about Kai and what Kai wants to talk about, though. Yeah. Speaking of disconnectable sway bars, <laughs> uh, let's, yeah, let's put it. Kai, thank you for joining us. What we like to do as we transition to the part of the show where we talk to and about our guests in depth is to have you introduce yourself, introduce your background, tell us at what point in your life, where in your life you, you know, went and got into off-roading and, you know, how you uh, became the personality that you became. One question at a time. There was like seven questions in there. Chris, you know that. Just, <laughs> like, Kai, I'm, I'm telling Kai he can check them off one at a time is yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll start with how I get into off-roading and um, then I'll go from there. So my FJ is my first off-road vehicle. And when I was shopping for a vehicle back then, uh, it was the FJ the other vehicle I was going to get was the Subaru XV Crosstrek. That was the, I think it was 2013. That was the yeah. first, first model year of the XV Crosstrek. And back then, I, I wasn't a off-road enthusiast uh, or a, a really car guy. And the FJ, I, I was just unsure how much it's, it, I feel it's overbill for me. I, I'm not going to go off-road that much. Mm to do an FJ. Um, so I was really into the XV Crosstrek. But but from uh, after a series of events, long story short, I, I still got an FJ. And then after that, uh, I started going on the forums, the Blue Room, the FJ Cruiser forums. Um, mm-hmm. Back then, not much Facebook group, actually. So it and, was... And the FJ Cruiser forums is still kicking. But the yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lost art. The, the forums are all lo- lost art. <laughs> right. Yeah. And back then, was the, there was the FJ Summit, and there was all kinds of stuff. It's it's a... Right. Man, good <sighs> good days. Good days. It, yeah. it was a, it was such a s- simple days. I don't think there's Instagram back then. It was just... Definitely not in the capacity that it, it is. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Damn. Man, such n- nostalgia. <laughs> And uh, right, um, yeah, that's and, Instagram's 2010 when it first started, so okay, but not, but you're right, not to the point it is now, yeah. It was, it was yeah, and then now all of a sudden, I feel it just uh, everyone talk and behave and do things differently back then. Um, and yeah, and then after I got that, I started to thinking, all right, bigger tires, uh, more lift, and uh, and all that, uh, and because I have a mecha- mechanical engineering background, um, I-, I think um, I don't necessarily know more or have more experience, but, mm-hmm. oh yeah, thanks. Um, but mm-hmm. I think with, with the, the technical, so in engineering, I don't do anything uh, career-wise with automotive. Uh, I do new product mm-hmm. development. Uh, I, the, the products that we design is, uh, motorized shades so they can be big uh, they can be 12 feet by 12 feet or 30 feet by 30 feet uh, mm-hmm. so i deal with a lot of structural components gears motors uh, brackets um, but in mechanical engineering a lot of it is 
the application of concepts exactly works from field to field or you know item to item whether it's you know shades or or production gears like a gear yeah. gear exactly exactly so so i think i think i, I was very fortunate that i have that mindset and in the training so very soon uh, for example after i i lift my fj uh the first one it was a toy tech boss two and a half inch lift mm. okay um, with yeah. the spc control arm. and back it was the older design the older spc uh, after control arm and right after that probably two weeks in i i realized man i have no down travel left um basically then i, I realized man this in back then i don't even know what independent suspension is so like uh, but then i see man these control arms they just move it move down and stop here if i lift it i have less down travel and more up travel um and i actually made some videos probably like 10 years later now on my YouTube channel about talking about this topic. But back then, immediately after I lifted, within a few weeks, I, I realized it. I think, man, this is so bad. Uh, I, I, I Actually, for, for a couple of weeks, I said, I should have got a Jeep. <laughs> for this oh, time. no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we, the, we love Jeeps, but we also, uh, we also know that that is a phrase you never say. <laughs> <laughs> Were yeah. you were you going off road at this point with the like was this I, I a, a conscious thing you realized or was this just like proxy of engineering background? It was actually proxy. I I didn't go off road till two years later after I got the truck. Okay. Um. Then, so actually, um, I was actually I I didn't lift the truck immediately. So so it's about the same time. I, I lift it first, then I go off road. Mm -hmm. Um. Then, and I'll, so probably I had that first lift for uh, one to two months, probably. I took it off and went long travel um, because that escalated just, very quickly. Oh <laughs> yeah. And that, it, it's, a, it's a weird looking truck back then, the FJ. I have stock front bumpers, stock everything, and 33 all terrain. It, it looks really sleeper, it looks mm -hmm. pretty much stock. But has long travel suspension down there. Uh, uh, long travel. Uh, it was a total chaos plus two inch long travel from. Mm -hmm. um, then I start to play with the spring rate um, and all that. Um, so a lot of them I I I, I made videos now. Um, so so I think in in the after I start modding the FJ, I get more and more into wheeling, uh, wheel more and more, and the one thing I need to get is the front bumper, um, both for look and uh, having a winch and uh, higher approach angle and all that. Uh, so I start shopping, but a lot of the ones existing on the market, I wasn't happy with the structural design. Um, there, there are ones that I like the look, but the, the structural design are just not not there it just not good at all um the australian ones are actually pretty good the structural wise but they are also like rb and yeah and iron man um tjm yeah uh, tjm is, has come a long way i have an iron man bumper on, on my mm -hmm. and yeah it, it's yeah uh, it, it has some meat Mm -hmm. as but, you would you know yeah. they're just way too bulky for from my yeah. like yeah so so that's why i started designing my own bumper um but at the same time i have a full-time job so uh it, it's a really off time thing and i kind of yeah stop and, project yeah stop and go uh i revamped fully redesigned it many times i think from start to finish um probably three years oh wow so i made my first <laughs> uh my first one was oh, okay. in 2017 okay mm -hmm. and um it was just a one-off thing um i wasn't considering selling or making it anything to just i just wanted on my fj uh so in 2017 i so i worked with the shop they they have it's 
so everything is 3D design, so it's all folded. So um, it was laser cut and CNC bend. And what a friend who who was a uh, experienced welder uh, helped weld it. We welded together, uh, and um, so it was. It cost way more than buying a the most expensive bumper back then in the market because I was yeah. making one, um, and I was using uh, like the laser cutting and the sheet metal bending. Uh, if I just do one, it's very expensive. <laughs> so. Uh, but it, it was the economies first. of scale and all that. Exactly. Shit. Yeah, you learn in business school. Yeah, yeah, but um, it it was a fun project. So I had it I had my first bumper on my FJ. Um, but then start starting after that, I think that's when Instagram started to grow more and more. And I also I started using Instagram, mm -hmm. and, and people starting to uh, and also Facebook groups. Uh, so people start to see my bumper and more and more interest uh, build up. And so, so in 2021, um, I decided to start uh, producing uh, just a batch, a small batch to sell a lot of uh, uh, great people uh, online asking. Yeah, that was the first one. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it looks uh, there are some small differences to my production version, but uh, most most of it is the same. Generals, um, the, the AT twos too, man. Your truck's come a yeah. long way. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and by the way, this is my second set of long travel already. <laughs> the the total chaos, the plus two, uh, kind of as a mechanical engineer, I, I I took the thing off and cycled it to see what's limiting the up travel was limiting the down travel it wasn't as good as i like um not as good as advertise uh, travel wise uh, number wise definitely not as good so i went with the, the this is the camber plus three and a half um so this is where where it does that in 2017 uh, oh you can actually see in the back i have a suzuki samurai back in there yeah <laughs> but I, I sold it i just don't have time oh, okay. to yeah yeah, but it's a fun uh, truck. If you're gonna run a samurai, you might as well just get a side by side. <laughs> yeah. It's, aside from the license plate on, it's just <laughs> right. it's the same level of capability, you know. Yeah. So so in 2011, 21, um, I decided to so I registered Tinker Design Studio LLC as a it's a one person business. Um, I work with my local uh, fab shop. It's also in Pennsylvania. They have the um, the the state of art in, uh, equipment um, and the professional welders. Oh yeah, nice. That's that was before my first prototype. I was prototyping with cardboard and wood. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, it looks pretty good in cardboard and wood. <laughs> it looks better than a lot of bumpers look in fucking metal. You know. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, so then in 2021, after I started selling bumpers, uh, at the same time, um, I, I meet mean, I mean my girlfriend. We've been dating for for years, so I'm thinking getting married soon. So, and I, I'm I'm 30, so I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna start being a family guy soon. Um, is this the time I give up my dream? Or this is the time I, I give it a bigger try. <laughs> leap uh, or not leap, yeah. Right. Because, um, so I, I love my full-time job. Uh, as And I, I've been with the company for seven years. And uh, the company likes me. I like the company. But um, I just don't have time to uh, do much on Tinker Design. I also have ideas about YouTube videos. Uh, I think I, I my first video was about long travel suspension that was around the same time in 2011 the 2021. Um, yeah. I just don't have enough time to do these uh, as much as I like. So in November 2021, I quit my full time job. And oh man, 
you, you, start. You jumped. Yeah, you jumped. Yeah, it, it's a big jump. So yeah, my my boss was surprised. Um, everyone was kind of surprised. It's it said, man, you, you're you're pretty happy here. You're doing well, and uh, we like you. You like us. <laughs> what <all of> else? <laughs> you you're leaving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I told them it's it's not because of better opportunity or anything. I just want to do this before I couldn't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so at least uh, 10 years down the road, even I'm not doing this anymore, I'm not doing Tinker Design anymore, um, I'll feel, I won't be, I won't feel regret. I feel mm -hmm. I tried it when I was young, when I was still able to. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. that was a yeah. big, big leap. Um, so then I started the self-employed uh, lifestyle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> It, it it was it was a uh, a lot of fun but it was also kind of scary because all of a sudden you don't have a uh steady income mm -hmm. especially that was so 2022 is inflation started to take off and in the beginning of 2022 when i start plan to sell my second batch of bumper my cost of the bumper um, so there are a couple parts there are the material there are the fabrication then the welding a lot of them is almost doubled so so for the yeah. second yeah the, the steel price really skyrocketed around that time so my second batch bumper I almost made no money I, mm -hmm. I, because I already took took orders so I couldn't I couldn't be like Rivian tell my customer I'm gonna raise my price <laughs> oh man <laughs> I yeah, couldn't do that <laughs> Dude, or oh. not just Rivian, like all, there's how many off-road companies that have taken orders for skids and sliders and bumpers and, you know, odds and ends. And since they've taken the orders and taken the deposits, they've gone, oh, by the way, you know, it was it was uh, $800 for our sliders, <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, you gave us 100 bucks, it's going to be 1300 bucks for the sliders. Mm. And yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's is by the book good business but because there's always a person behind the business it's not good business yeah yeah it, it was uh pretty scary that back, back then um and but luckily my my wife was very supportive and uh, she's still working so we, we at least can we can pay the bill <laughs> <laughs> but um it was scary time so unfortunately i had to raise my price in the next batch so mm -hmm. so my bumper are pretty expensive um uh, but most of it's just how complex the internal structure is and and also I, i'm not welding it myself i have a professional welder welder for me so uh there is you can say there's a middleman in there you uh, uh you you didn't see a desire to weld yourself to uh get into the fabrication side of things um i almost thought about that after i see the price raises so much <laughs> uh, but then i after i calm down i think uh welding i, I like welding I, I know how to weld but not just not not professional yeah. uh, i feel that will take up pretty much all my time i'll be right. as a welder every day so mm. I think the best I should utilize is my my brain to design the next product uh, or make videos. Um, yeah, time so, is money, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's because I'm a, I'm I'm still a one man operation, so it's uh, time is very limited, and and it's I started to really appreciate just um, when, when back then I was in my and working for corporate. With a big team, everybody had to do their parts, and in the end, we make a very complex product. We we make that happen. That that was just pretty amazing. And if I'm just alone, uh, it's really hard to do complex things. Um, so, uh, so then I, I keep selling bumpers in 2022, and also make more videos. Uh, so I think then. It's probably the next transition is um, at the same time I, I designed, started designing the rear bumper, some skids, 
but because I, I'm kind of digging in too much, all my development process is very slow. Mm -hmm. um, so, but at the same time, my YouTube channel did pretty well. Uh, I'm actually- Yeah, you could say that. You, I mean, given the Toyota 4x4 community is eclectic and tight knit and everything, but your mm -hmm. your videos have gone what we could call viral inside <laughs> our, you know, our little <laughs> chaotic world that is the Toyota 4x4 world. Um, but yeah, you, you could say that they've done well in, in with our, you know. I appreciate <laughs> it. You know? I mean, you got 40,000 subscribers in two years. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Yeah, I think I think relative to being to my bumper business, I would say, my product business. Um, so because the, and I am actually pretty surprised how many people enjoy so nerdy and technical content. Um, it's the Toyota 4x4 people, they are, yeah. and we, I don't know I said they, we are we, nerds, I like, yeah, we are we. the nerds, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are the nerds of the 4x4 world. Awesome. Yeah, that, I, I feel very, uh, fortunate and i really appreciate all the, the, the support from the community um so so then i started to think maybe i should uh pivot doing youtube more mm -hmm. uh, so before I, I do youtube because one is just straight out of hobby uh, i feel like there's some idea i want to share uh, and i also like to play with camera so <laughs> just a hobby uh at the same time it was uh, kind of marketing for my uh, product business mm -hmm. um so then I, I start to probably late 2022 to early this year and gradually uh, it wasn't a, a flip a switch type of thing it, it's kind of gradual uh, i feel maybe i should just focus more on youtube uh, because i'm working alone and doing product is, uh, if I just spend time designing product, then I had to manage all the supply chain, work with the supplier. Um, it, it, or my, my supplier in Pennsylvania was very, very good, very helpful. They, they helped mm -hmm. me. Um, but every time I sell a batch of bumpers, there's a lot of work that they, they need to ship freight and uh, I pack the hardware box and all that. Um, it just a lot of overhead work. Mm -hmm. uh, cost is that manufacturing is actually like <laughs> a business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I feel YouTube doing content will be much easier to uh, as a one man show, uh, and I think I can still bring positive value to the community by mm -hmm. sharing knowledge. Uh, so oh yeah. Yeah, you're tapping into an aspect and a, a a knowledge portion of things that is like untapped. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, so so that's that's kind of my where I'm going. Um, so I, I kind of dropped. Uh, so I was designing bigger projects like the rear bumper with some some pretty new features, uh, but it just take a long time. Uh, so that's why I, I paused and designed my shift knob. Um, so the shift knob is much easier to uh, design and, and ship and handle. Um, <clears throat> but I think my shift knob has some unique feature as well, but that that is more like my YouTuber merch. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, you yeah. have to have the merch. Yeah. Yeah. So th this is um, I can reach a lot more vehicles all of a sudden. Almost all Toyota and Lexus uh, related vehicle. I, I have a model uh, for it uh, because I I kind of architect the parts so I can share a lot of the aluminum parts. Then uh, it, it fits a lot of different vehicles. <clears throat> yep. So that's a good place to be though because i mean and chris you can probably attest this the only other 
person, company, I don't, I don't even know what to call them or reference that has that uh that is doing the shift knob stuff is um a A A T J A A T T. Yeah. Yeah. They they make like a fob case thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. But that's yeah. all, as far as like aftermarket, you know, Toyota four by four, Lexus four by four, shift up products, or you know, any like accessories that that's where it kind of starts and ends. I like I like that transfer that's case now. That's fun. fun. That's yeah. They well, <laughs> I think they got their break, like their big their their big break on uh on like FJ, you know. And like early fourth gen or uh, fifth gen four under like the dual, the transfer case shift knob and the transmission shift knob right, right next to each other. So I like I like guys just because they're they're so much better to look at than what the stock yeah. knob is. I, I wasn't gonna <laughs> say that, but 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 yeah, yeah. Like and finding yeah. good image to be honest, it's even hard to find a good image of the stock knob unless it's an eBay listing. <laughs> like this is so boring like i i, I might have a cool off-roader i want something that looks neat that looks like mm-hmm. an 80s shift knob dude that yeah. that was a image search for 100 series that's 100 oh man i think that they share the same one the 180 yeah yeah it looks like childhood <laughs> <laughs> i don't know yeah i was born in 91 so that looks like uh you know God, you're born in ninety one. <laughs> yes, that's there you the... go. Yep. Mine's not that yellow though. <laughs> Shit, I'll ship you a bottle of spray paint if you need. That's not get. That's that's bad. Hey, that's I, bad. I, I. To be honest, I haven't even talked about the Lexus at all. But the other day, I did make sure I shifted into low and made sure that the low transfer case did engage oh, yes. and work. And I and I had that thought in the middle of traffic, but I've been playing with older vehicles long enough now that I was like, wait, so we're out of traffic, close to the house, but if I do have to push yes, it home. This is something we don't need to talk about in the capacity of just older vehicles. Everybody and anybody who has a 4x4 at the takeoff road, please exercise your four low with some regularity. Whether it's every two weeks or every two months shift it into four low and, make, and just especially just, just make sure it works Lube especially it. if it's not switch or if it is switch activated like the yes. lexus is now a handle where in the sequoia before mm-hmm. i was out in moab like it's just put it in neutral push it in and mm-hmm. turn that little knob and uh-huh. then hope the lights all go on the correct way yep the GX Which they is, did. Um, it's not a button, but it's like a push down, and it's yeah, it's a knob, isn't it? So no, it's uh, yeah. The GX has the full time four wheel drive, so it's kind of different. Yeah, it, so, it's the same as the fourth gen V eight four runners and the GX four seventy. Yeah, it's yeah, kind of like so a, it's like a, a the, on the Land Cruisers and the LXs. It yeah. It's just a matter of how you tell it to go into low, you know. So in my truck, it's like it's like a little toggle switch that you have to push down on and then pull back towards you. But yeah. it doesn't really make sense because it if it has two inches of let's call it an, an inch of travel front to back, the only way it goes is that three quarters inch towards you like there's no other actual direction it can go it's just one of those things they designed in such a silly way mm-hmm. i'll find i'll i'll send chris a picture just it, well it. it's like trying to find an interior photo that shows this knob i am i'm a better googler than this and i'm not which uh oh and speaking of the the four low even the Forerunner and the FJ with the transfer case lever, the knob, mm-hmm. it, the front differential, the ADD, that axle disconnect, that thing 
can still break, that still require electronic actuation. So, so even you have a lever, it, it, it's still not full manual. You can, you're still in the mercy of electronics and actuator seizing up. Um, it actually happened to my my FJ that the ADD was had water damage and uh, didn't work. Oh um, no! And um, it's very common. It's almost like the the, the Rubicon uh, sway bar. The sway bar. Down <laughs> there is the ADD. So, so, Ross, it's effectively a switch, basically. Pretty much, but you have to push down. You can't just toggle it back you have to push down yeah it's it, it's a switch like it has to go it has to go switch. like towards the bottom of the vehicle and then towards the rear of the vehicle yeah. to actuate it back into four low um i i only have all right the bottom right switch yeah this yeah, is what this is what we're discussing that is really weird because for me that switch on the bottom right to go to four wheel drive low is in the position to the left of it. It's over here. Yeah. And the one to the right of it is the downhill ascent control. Mm. And because mine's a base, it doesn't have any of those other guys above it, which I don't need those. I don't want those. The fun, I, the fun ones. They're they're not fun. They no. They're the ones that break. Um, yeah. They're, they don't break. They're just unnecessary. Like just I don't I want off road. I want traction control off, and I want nothing else. I don't want anything fucking with me. I just want to drive my truck. I don't want the computer to get in the way, you know. So every other image I come to still has the high four high four low on that side. Really? Maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. <laughs> I I would love that you're right, and you just have a crazy rare truck that's been installed backwards like that's that's what i want to happen <laughs> i'm gonna buy photoshop just for the sake of this <laughs> or you could just send it to me and i could switch it for you <laughs> awesome, awesome. so um so kai so you and i've had a, a couple exchanges uh you're in pennsylvania mm -hmm. i'm in connecticut obviously um i've i've spent copious amounts of time exploring the Pennsylvania off-road parks mm. and you said you are familiar with the Roush and AOAA um more on the Roush AOAA more, more on the Roush side okay where uh where where's your your go-to for testing like can you can you share your secrets of where you've done your uh your famous sway bar videos and and you know all of this yeah, yeah, I can, I can if you, if you want, I can send you some GPX uh, tracks. <laughs> Ross would love those. <laughs> I, I would, I would. It's um, and we just had the um, there's a group called FJ Northeaster, uh, in the it, it it was scheduled the first kind of off road group I I wheel with when I first started. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is at Rush Creek. Um. So we just had the annual run, FJ Northeaster annual run a couple of weeks ago, and I was trial leading in nice. Roush. At Roush, okay. Um, have you uh, you been it out west? Any bucket list stuff for you that you're you're looking to do, looking to check off? So I've been to Moab. I've been to Texas on my FJ. The last bucket list i think there are two bucket lists one is arizona uh, mm -hmm. the pr uh, the other is the ruby Trail. okay those two are on my bucket list two shows in a row discussing rubicon <laughs> yeah right where in texas you got big bend or um we went to the morris morris adventure hmm. uh they basically it's at the very north, I think the closest big city is, man, I forgot what that called, Amarillo. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. They say it's the 
second largest canyon in the U.S. Okay. Hmm. After Grand Canyon, but it it might be really? just how how they define canyon geologically, right. because I definitely see bigger like canyon looking thing, but they may not be called. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like Texas, Texas has its own way of. Yeah, Texas everything is privately owned, so that canyon is privately mm -hmm. owned. Uh, they they made it into um, an off road park. Uh, and it was pretty, pretty good. Um, trial Recon Channel, uh, work with them. They, they have their Trial Recon Summit there. Um, yeah. so vaguely, it, vaguely familiar. Yeah, so the, the unique part of it is, unlike Rouse Creek, Rouse Creek is just wheeling. That is, there's campground, campsites inside the, the trails. Mm -hmm. So you can wheel and just camp in there. And yeah, and, and, and the scenery is look pretty, it's kind of crazy looking. Uh, kind of some part looks like Moab, some part like Colorado. Uh, then you go down, there's big elevation change because it's canyon. So it, it's a very variety, different thing. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are definitely technical stuff um and uh, all i remember that the most memorable thing is how much sand there is and how much wind there is um <laughs> sounds about right sounds yeah about sounds right. okay wind sounds like a no thank you wind yeah. and a rooftop tent are not great ingredients yeah that's yeah. where you just pack it in and sleep in the truck i was uh, we had our rooftop tent at night it just it literally feels like someone was hitting my 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 wall my tent wall tried to wake me up um it, it was pretty scary that's terrible any uh <clears throat> we've had a bunch of people on the show that have had rooftop tents and then been like that was the worst thing i ever did in terms <laughs> of my modifications any any uh favorites or least favorites or like top recommendations that you can give people from like your experience and engineering standpoint so so the the latest update is about two weeks ago i removed my top 10 <laughs> oh, there you go yep but, right on cue but um i had mine for three years i think yeah, this is the first picture I removed my rooftop tent. I actually didn't really show. Um, but in previous photo, you'll see I have a rooftop tent on top. Uh, the, the one I had was the, it's the same model as the Roof Nest Falcon, the first generation Falcon, mm -hmm. or the CVT Mount Hood single channel. Uh, it, it's on the, the thinner and lighter side. Uh, but because I don't have a front sway bar, it it was still it it's adds too much to the body row on highway. Um, off road, I don't feel I'm gonna tip over off road. I, I went through like the Moab, the Hell's Gate, and uh, off camber stuff. I, I don't feel worried. Uh, mostly it's highway. I, I don't feel comfortable for my wife driving my FJ. Um, so I, I think, but on the, the flip side, the rooftop tent does set up very fast. Uh, the, the hard shell, the wedge style uh, mm -hmm. hard shell tent. The flip out one, the, the, the soft one, I used to have that, uh, the, have the Smitty Bill Overlander tent. That That is not worth it. That That's slower than a ground tent. She but does. this hard, hard shell one, the wedge style, it's a lot faster. And it's definitely, um, it take the stress off me because a lot of time back then I was working. I usually, I leave Friday night after work and I need to hit, drive a few hours and camp uh, at a campsite. I usually arrive 11 or midnight. Um, ever since I had the rooftop tent, I, I just have no stress. Mm -hmm. uh, Man, I'm gonna arrive so late. It's cold and it's raining. 
I have no stress. It, it just so because it's so quick. Um, and it's also pretty quick to pack up to this particular style tent, uh, even at off-road events, like when I go to um, Appalachian Toyota Roundup, basically I need to pack 10 every morning uh, and go to driver's meeting. Um, no stress doing that, it's just so mm. quick. Um, so that's the big plus. Um, although I remove my tent now for performance reason, I have not camped after I remove my tent. So uh, <laughs> I haven't experienced the ground tent again yet. So no, maybe... just uh, no in, in car camping, no like mattress or, you know, sleep table. Like so many people prod themselves on engineering or concocting. Oh, you mean inside the vehicle? Yeah. 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 I, I, I would love that. But uh, with my wife and I, and the gear, uh, the FJ is just a little too small for it. Uh, I did the rear seat delete in my FJ, so I, I can do that pretty easily. It's, it's a, I build a flat uh, platform in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it's just me, I have a single um, single human mattress, that the narrow thing. Um, I think that that's a pretty good solution. Uh, but now, with two person and other gears, uh, the FJ is a little small. Yeah, yeah. You gotta That's... you gotta go up to a Sequoia to sleep in it on your own. I know <laughs> for your <laughs> height you do. Yeah, for, for I really most like normal Sequoia. height people you don't. <laughs> I really like the Sequoia. It's um, you you have the second gen, right? Yeah. Okay. And what I just thought of is, I know mine has the captain's chairs. Oh. Um, and so the each captain's chair also has a a board, for lack of a better word, on the back of the captain's chair. That then, once you fold it flat, it folds across the the gap to where the third oh. row seat is when it's folded flat. And so it cool. creates a mostly level section. Wow. But I, now I'm wondering about the bench seat. Huh. If it has the same piece on the back of it it does mm -hmm. um here, here i'm gonna oh man is that a big enough image we'll find out um oh it's kind of tiny but what it does so okay pops up for you guys so all of these see that like the flaps here this flap uh if you lift that up this the rest of the back of this then folds across to the third row oh, no and you way. can see the cutout for the rear fender well wow um and so for me, mine has the center console, which is then uh, it with the seats folded flat, it's taller or it's higher, but then the center console, so the center console is weird. It has the ability to flip up and uh, access stuff inside, or you can go to the back of it and flip the whole thing forward. And it creates the similar height to oh, the captain's geez. chair folded flat. <laughs> That's right. I never know too much about the second gen Sequoia, but it sounds like Toyota was ahead of its game in Overland. Right? Like they were like, oh, no, no, you guys can definitely sleep in your cars. I yeah. Like, I'm not that poor, guys. The, I don't want to be the one to say this, but it, uh, but they, it's, they did the, uh, the second gen, they did better than the third gen in terms of packaging and on the inside, human capacity. Like that, what you just showed on the screen is way better than what the third gen offers in terms of sleepability yeah the third third row seat on a third gen is, is unfortunate compromise for those yeah. bad yeah it's here so i got it it is. it is i have an image of the second gen with everything folded flat and all the flaps to oh <laughs> yeah that's great i could that's that's, that's a full bed like it's a full uh, size mattress yeah, you can get between there. Right. <laughs> wow. I, I didn't know that you have this thing. This is almost look like aftermarket. I no, know. that's all factory. <laughs> yeah. I never expect that Toyota will make this for uh, out of factory. It was pretty thoughtful. I'm so, sure that is bigger than my bed. Yeah. The the part I liked is that even when parking, I'd be like, all right, I need to find a mostly level spot. But the captain's chairs were always a little bit higher towards the front, even like if you got relatively flat. That's like so a I never had, 
Yeah, yeah I right. never had to think about like switching my head <laughs> or like finding uh, that perfectly flat uh, spot because it was always just generally pretty close to it already. But do you have some kind of, is there an exit, like a pole for the rear door? Or do you have to climb There out is there? not. But what I would do is I would just get in the driver's side rear passenger door because exactly. then I could like take off what he was talking about about the sand. I could take off my Moab dusty shoes, bang them off outside, stash yeah. them just in front of the folded captain's chair and just kind of bring my legs up, pivot and put my legs out. And there nice. I was nice. in bed. So, um, <laughs> and wow. thus, thus Kai does not camp in the FJ. Correct. That it was for what it was for, cause I'm a little short of six foot four. So like for me being a little bit taller guy, like the Sequoia was great to sleep inside of. I didn't think I was going to say that. Um, but I'm, I have some ground tenting coming up and I'm pretty sure I'm going to miss the inside of the Sequoia. <laughs> Just get one of those cheap, like quick inflate mattresses. From Walmart well, or I, something. I have, camp mattresses like oh like the yeah. thermarest whatever rei ones like i have that but like a tent so, wiggles in the breeze and there's always a breeze in kansas like yeah yeah that the the worst part about ground tenting i the least part i, I like is packing it up because uh, in the east coast even if it's not raining the next day the, the bottom of the tent is wet oh yeah it's You're always so wet so right wet. dude and Pop usually, up tent with a pad is, yeah, right. And it's when you pack up, it's it's wet and usually with mud and some grass and some bug and slugs maybe. Um, <laughs> Gross. And, we don't want to talk yeah. about slugs. Let's <laughs> no. Yeah, where's slugs? Not, I'm not. I'm unfamiliar with this concept. Not, it's not something we. Nope. Wait, you no. don't know slugs? I know it's something, right? Yeah. 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 They don't happen very frequently around me, but I am aware of them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I I usually have I have a footprint, uh, like a tarp tarp like footprint. Um, but even, even that is just the, the, the either the footprint is super dirty, or if it rains, sometimes it even I tuck the footprint under the tent, it, it still mm-hmm. gets wet between them. So it was you always a mess to pack it up um so so i i have the ground tent i i have the, the gazelle t3 it's a pop-up yeah. tag, and also have the oz tent rv3 yeah it's all fast mm-hmm. tent um they are fast to sh- to to set uh, to to make the to uh erect the tent but if you count the bedding and everything else and also take all this all everything away then take the tent away and keep it still relatively clean it, it takes a long time mm. um so those, yeah those so oz I, tents are interesting yeah oz tent uh, it's it's like a hotel yeah <laughs> we've been talking to more and more people who just do like the australian style swags yeah and and that's it like they just like i'm gonna climb in my little tube and go to bed and wake up and i'm not on the ground because i'm technically like on a little accordion platform and that's it and it's you know get the job done it's not a (laughs) it's not luxury luxury sleeping by any means but it's more comfortable than just like a ground tent and more convenient than um than also a ground tent yeah actually the, my i think my, my favorite tent it's kind of go back to the basic i have the i think it's alps mountaineering links to it's basically that like the rei co-op two mm-hmm. person tent that this the backpacking tent basically yeah uh, it I feel after trying all this tent out, um, maybe because I'm a small, small and weak person, I don't even <laughs> think it's it's just handling the bulk is my biggest pain. The the Oz tent it, it's so long, it's like eight feet long. I had to put it on the rack. Um, but the the backpacking tent it's very easy to handle, and even if it's wet, I can put it on the hood of the FJ to let it dry a little bit. 
Uh, even I have to, I can wipe it down one person. The other 10 is just too big to, to do that. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe Chris can, with a bigger guy, can, can do that more easily, but. Um, uh, unfamiliar territory for me. <laughs> well, for, for me, uh, we typically, if we're going to use our full tent, I use an eight man tent because I have four kids. And so. Oh, that's right. Like for, for, for uh, like, it's a giant <laughs> duffel bag that goes to the back of the truck basically is it's a Marmon, uh, Marmon eight man tent, but like it's, it is, I I've enjoyed sleeping in it because it has the, been the driest I've been mm. at night sleeping. But once I then get like, get up and it's like, all right, time to go like rain fly, tent, ground cloth. Like it's, I, th I think I actually have images of like, or maybe even a video, like after coming back from a campsite and my entire backyard is like a, uh, um, that picture. Yeah, it's it's yeah. like a, it feels like a yard sale. <laughs> it's tent detox. Yeah, um, like every everything in this image is a version of a tent. Like I get the drop the drop cloths are out in the sun. Got the other one on the other side. So this was after a camping trip where we took everybody. So we'd use the the awning or the easy up. We'd use all the yeah. rain flies around the porch. The tents were set up outside the yard in the sun, like just trying can, to stay in the sun all the time. I yeah. can smell this video. <laughs> yeah, it smells a little damp, right? Uh, a little. A little. Yeah. A little damp. So anyways, uh, Kai, where, uh, where is the favorite place you've ever gone off-roading and where is still on your bucket list to go? Favorite? Hmm. I will say... For strict wheeling, technical wise, um, the Moab trifecta, basically the poison spider, golden crack, and go bar. Did you do it in a single day? Yeah. Oh man. Okay. And, yeah. That there, there's kind of no one upping from there. Yeah, I, I did it with another vehicle. Is um, is iconic FJ. He he he's uh very active on blue room and also he's also a mechanical engineer so we we, we talk a lot we're similar age ah, um, okay <laughs> we got we got married the same same time uh like same year or or so mm. uh, so uh yeah he, is he, he's is his truck blue yeah blue okay iconic fj he yeah he he's much more advanced than me we have the same long travel suspension uh but he has a custom yeah that that's the one um yeah i, I took this photo those are 37s <laughs> yeah this is uh, when we were at moab that i took this photo uh yeah he's on 37 now he's on 39s oh god that's a weird size tire 39s <laughs> yeah just one inch short from 40 yeah it's and, like uh it's the oddball yeah yeah he uh basically two of us he, he was leading he, he did it once so we did it in one day um uh, yeah it was the just the sheer amount of traction there make it like make you do stuff you wouldn't ever imagine in the east coast um I think that that type of joy, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's easier. It's, um, it's like when you're playing video game, you've got a very strong <laughs> weapon and equipment so you can hit stronger boss. Uh, it's that type of feeling. Um, on the East Coast, um, yeah, when it's almost always wet, sometimes it's dry. It's almost always wet, and just a very simple like a stump or a tiny rock there, just at the right place, um, will just get you stuck there. Um, I, I am front end rear lock. I have B lock wheels. I'm less than ten psi, um, thirty five mud terrain. It it doesn't go much. Um, you had to go much more robust than that too. Mm -hmm. You really had the big fun in the East Coast, uh, but in Moab, you can be on a set of thirty uh, like KO twos. Uh, it, it the tire doesn't matter as much. Mm -hmm. Just with the sheer amount of traction, you can do a lot of crazy stuff. 
contact patch and we can deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, but um, Moab is, the environment was a little harsh. Not probably from, as an East Coast guy, <laughs> it's <laughs> so dry, uh, so much sun. Um, yep. Yeah. Meanwhile, people from Utah come east and they're like, oh my God, it's so humid and there's like, no <laughs> traction at all. You yeah. <laughs> Well, that was that was something on the Moab trip where I was like, they were the guys were talking, oh, I'll just throw out a little ground tent. But like, what, what kind of just discussed about like having a damp ground tent the next day does yeah. that doesn't register in their minds, <laughs> yeah, right? Because right. out there yeah. it's so dry, like it no, literally like, doesn't matter. People don't realize that like between the humidity and the changing temperatures and tree cover and whatnot, like things are always wet here. Yeah, know? short of drought, you know. Yeah, even then. <laughs> yeah, but I if say, I think, go ahead. No, you're good, guy. Go. Oh, so but but after I think about it, and after, um, because I have uh, that trip, I have some other friends also from the East Coast. We it's all all our first time go to Moab, mm -hmm. uh, but then we we thought, man, the the Moab is so so much fun, but there is still some type of charm of east coast wheeling and right? maybe it's the sh the tree like you're going mm -hmm. like the mountains or there, there's waterfalls or uh it just that maybe it's just we are used to it um uh, and not willing to change but right <laughs> uh, there's still some type of charm on east coast that uh, that i wouldn't feel like i'm gonna give up and only will at Moab. I I I don't feel like that. I still feel there are still um, the, the charm and the fun on the East Coast. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, but Moab trip, I would say, is still my favorite trip. It's just so different, and we did so much, uh, so much on our bucket list. We we hit everything like top of the world, the trifecta, the fins and things, uh, House Gate, House of Revenge uh then that's on easier trails uh, yeah that that was a pretty pretty nice trip oh that i think it's a it's a nice segue to to boast about toyota reliability yes yeah, yeah. so so yeah so what we didn't get into it and, and we're like we're way pushing our time here but um why toyotas and and what have you found in terms of your proclivities towards them to pay dividends yeah i i think um yeah i had a video on g versus toyota and we i touched on toyota reliability is uh i, I think for most of people that don't go crazy it, it's mainly the toyota uh, powertrain that is the the no big repair, a small repair you, you're still going to expect. Um, mm -hmm. Like the, the front diff ADD I, I mentioned and rear locker actuator sees up. That's very often. That's almost as often as the Jeep sway bar. Um, <clears throat> but the powertrain, the big, big ticket stuff, uh, not very often. Uh, but uh if you start messing with your truck doing crazy mods and going crazy trails um uh, that that would be a different story um uh, so on the moab trip we have we have a bunch of toyota we have a jeep wrangler jk and the chevy zr2 the colorado zr2 back then it was new it's 2021 and both the jeep and the chevy had issue so almost ruined their trip per se mm -hmm. they it didn't do the hard stuff, mm -hmm. um, but like mechanical issues or me mechanical issue. But at the same time, it's almost because of their own doing that the user that the JK has operator some, error, yeah. right? Has some RCV dry shaft, mm -hmm. um, which blowed up. <laughs> um, so, oh. so he he had to take take it easy. Um, the ZR2 did a re-gear and the gearing wasn't, it's probably not re-geared properly. So that wasn't Chevy's fault. Uh, but the ZR2 did have brake issue. 
Mm. Uh, basically, when we are at the first day, we're doing, um, what's it called? Top of the world. When we go downhill, he's in four low. And when we go downhill, he's supposed to put in transmission, put into first gear, low. And if you're four low and transmission low, if you need to stop and press the brake to the floor, the ZR2 couldn't stop. The ZR2 had, you had to put it into neutral to make it stop, which is super weird. Uh, and put it into neutral when you go steep downhill, that's the last thing you want to do. It, is, so, is it a, is it brake by wire or is that just a total? So, so that never, we never figured out and that, that friend just ended up selling the truck. Um, so the, the dealer. What do you replace it with? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, he the dealer checked multiple times, uh, like bleeding the brake and swapping brake parts and checking things. And they involved GM engineer. And in the end, they said, this is the way it is, uh, which we don't think it is. <laughs> Otherwise, Sounds more sketchy. <laughs> yeah. So he ended up selling the truck. Yeah. What uh, uh, he replaced it with something of interest? He or he with did... a Jeep. <laughs> uh, Okay, fair yeah. enough. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah, but, but Toyota def definitely, if you're not going crazy, it's definitely the best bet to have the least amount of headache. Um, mm -hmm. So I couldn't say that for my FJ. My FJ had have a lot of kind of the, the top performance part, uh, especially on suspension, right? My, my camber long travel plus the first generation RCV axles those two alone put my FJ on, on my lift for a year, just oh, fiddling nice. with the parts, uh, rebuilding things. And because so few people have those parts, there's not much um, that shared experience. Right. Um, there's I no just, like resources else. you can tap into for <laughs> right. definitive and, and, answers. Exactly. And, and the company are less uh, willing to work with you because they 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 are racing company they they don't want to deal with regular consumers on um, small problems yeah visibility so, is low in that capacity. right yeah yeah so you basically it's on your own if you want top performance um but like this this my friend is on 40s um i'm surprised he never broke a cv axle or snap a tie rod so yeah. much time. that's amazing yeah he, so he, he will pretty hard so tall <laughs> so yeah tall. I, I look basically stock here it's yeah <laughs> and you're not sure it's like it's oh well sweet ross is there anything else you want to ask kai yeah, before we wrap no, up um the only subsequent end of show question is when are we going to wheel together because you're one of the few and only people that we've had on the show that is in my vicinity and has actually gone to the places that I've gone to. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm down to whenever you're you're here. I'm, I'm only one hour from Rosh Street. So okay, an hour from Rosh. Okay, I can get on. So, okay, yeah. All right, we'll 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 do something. Sounds we'll do something good. Together. Look forward to it. I was, I was trying to pull up the maps real fast to see where Roush Creek was. <laughs> Roush is probably a half hour, uh, half hour southwest of Hazleton, if I'm mapping. So it's it's a cool 16 hours away. <laughs> Dude. Are you in just, Salt Lake City, Chris? No, I'm, I'm just in Kansas City. You oh. Did, uh, you just so Salt Lake is 16 for me the other way. So, yeah. oh. so come east and uh yeah. We'll, we'll... I saw I saw Kai had Winrock on there. I was like that's Tennessee. Oh yeah. yeah. I've we been there. Winrock. Yeah, I I mean or uh <clears throat> what keeps coming up for our hopeful potential would love to say inevitable uh, Expo East trip is Potts Mountain, which Potts mm. Mountain people say is. You yeah, know, I never, I've never been to an Overland Expo. Maybe I should go. Me wide. either. We're oh. uh, we're targeting Expo East this. Okay. Uh, Chris, when is it? Is it October? Early October. Yep. Early October. Yeah, we're we're targeting. 
Target and Expo East to go down and, and hang out and record a couple shows. And the funny uh, thing for me is Potts Mountain afterwards. Expo East and Roush are about the same. It's 16 or 14 hours. Like it's really not that big a deal. <laughs> Different. <laughs> well, we could, we could do Expo with like Potts and, and Wind Rock all in the same, you know, track. Yep. So. Mm. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, sweet. So, cool. I will wrap the show up real fast. You can rate me or you review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, do us a favor. Praise. Throw throw us something. Let us know your favorite episode. Like, yeah. just go ahead and leave a comment. Help us out there. Or just tell uh, me and Chris that you hate us. I'm, I'm just tell Ross that. Uh, <laughs> I got I got enough going on. <laughs> like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, you can follow Kai at Tinkerer's Adventure. Is that and then tinkerer.design and then tinkerdesign.com. That's right. That's right. Uh and follow Hooniverse, the Hooniverse on Twitter, the real Hooniverse on Instagram. Ross is no, not like the one from Friends on Instagram. I'm at Overlaining Dad. And thank you for joining us, Kai. We did a show. Yeah. Thanks, Kai. Thank you for having me. Great talk. Great talk.